Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Steve Horwitz, Charles A. Dana Professor of Economics and Department Chair at St. Lawrence University and author of the new book, Hayek's Modern Family, Classical Liberalism and the Evolution of Social Institutions. Welcome back to Free Thoughts, Steve. Hi, guys. My pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So you're an economist and you've written a book about family. So did you just get bored with economics apparently <laughs> and decided you wanted to write about child rearing or something like that? Uh, it's a great question. and It's an interesting answer to how I came into this. Uh, it actually came out of my teaching. One of the great things about teaching at a liberal arts college is you get the opportunity to do interdisciplinary stuff and, and work with colleagues. And uh, as part of our first year seminar program a number of years ago, 20 years ago now, um, I, I ended up teaching at the time with a, with a couple of colleagues who were interested in family issues. And, and so I thought, hey, I'm an economist. Gary Becker talked about family. We can, we can do this. Uh, and, we, and I taught with one of those folks for a couple of years and then she left. And then since then, uh, I've taught now that course six times uh, with a colleague in the psychology department who turned out to be a wonderful uh, you know, sort of co-teacher, teaching partner and friend. And she introduced me to a lot of the sort of family stuff that's in here and the legal stuff too. She also has a law degree. And sort of our work together got me thinking about the family as a social institution and trying to teach that to, to, to you know, first year students and why sort of libertarians haven't talked about it, right? I mean, you think, you know, why haven't libertarians said very much at all about the family and what could they say about the family? And in particular, what could someone who sort of was trained in, in economics and in, in, in Austrian economics and Mises and Hayek, what could, what insights could they bring to that conversation? So this seems, I mean, not initially kind of an odd project, especially coming from a Austrian or Hayekian direction, because the thing that we all know about the main thing we know about Hayek and the Austrian school is the knowledge problem and the price system solving the socialist calculation debate. And these seem to be things that are very different from the way that we think about families. Like we – families seem structured almost entirely opposite to the way we think about a market economy and that you do have distribution along central planning lines and whatnot. So is this – is it as an odd a fit as it initially seems? Uh, I, I don't think so. I think one of the things that you find really in Hayek, but it's in Mises too, actually. But but I'll, I'll focus on sort of Hayek's version of it. Is the idea that, that you know markets aren't the appropriate solution to every human social problem? It's, it's funny. Just I just want to say that there's so many people who don't who don't even know that sentence. They think that Hayek thinks that he the markets are solution to every social problem. So in, in fact, yeah, right. And and you know if you've read the introduction, right, I I have one of those in the introduction more or less, right, where I have to combat that right off the bat. But yeah, I think that's really important. And Hayek's very clear, right. You know, we for the smaller tasks that we do, intentional kind of cooperative, we call them communities or whatever, right, uh, uh, can be very effective. And, and we have lots of those firms, right? The firm has elements of that sort of, you know, uh, they're, they're in that, I'm going to use the word carefully, but they're socialist or altruistic or whatever, you know, collective, whatever word you want to use. And and the, the reason we need the market is that once we get beyond a, a relatively small number of people and we get beyond the ability to, to sort of engage with each other face to face and to sort of know what each other wants, in essence, when we're dealing with anonymous human beings, we need the market to coordinate our activities. We need prices and, and all the things that we were just talking about to do the job because now we're outside the bounds of, of, of the – of the world of the intimate or known uh, and into the world of the unknown and anonymous. And so markets enable us to coordinate in that world. One way to think about it is what markets do is coordinate between and are among families and firms and, and all these other little sort of islands of cooperation and collaboration. That's what markets are. So, so to even say, even when people say, well, Hayek's all about the market, what the market is, is a collection of little, you know, I'm exaggerating a bit, but little versions of socialist collectives, right, scattered all over the place. So, so in, in a more, I guess, sort of abstract sense or specific, because you kind of touched on it, but, but what is the Hayekian view of social institutions in general and how they're created and what they're supposed to do. Yeah, they're 
they're problem solvers, right? I mean, I think the best way to think about social institutions is is that is, is think in terms of their function, right? What do they do, right? And what they do is they solve some problem that human beings have. Um, and and most, not all, but most social institutions came about through sort of social evolutionary spontaneous order, as Hayekians would call it, processes where you know nobody invented them, sort of whole cloth, but rather human beings who had problems that needed to be solved. If we think about the family, right, we have to raise these helpless infants into reasonably functioning adults, uh, among other things that families do, but that's certainly an important one. So the, the way in which social institutions come about and organize themselves will be responses to the particular problems that any particular situation at any particular time uh, you know, throw up uh, and that social institutions will solve. An important part about that too, right, is social institutions aren't static. They evolve and change and that's part of that spontaneous or, order story too. Uh, one of the, I think, things that I try to get out on the table early in the book is, is this sort of relationship between function and form and recognizing that the form that social institutions, the structure that social institutions have um, is, is tightly linked to the particular functions they perform. What are they, what they look like will depend not solely but largely on what they do. And that, that's important because you say that very early on that it, if you talk to conservatives and they say the family is dying – uh, or something like this. Uh, they're they're seeming to not clarify the difference between the form of the family, whether it's Leave It to Beaver and Ozzie and Harriet, and the function about what a family is supposed to do. Right, and I think that also comes in a lot with the phrase, and I, you know, with students over the years, this is the one that comes up a lot: is is what what do we mean by a normal family? Right, I mean normal can have this understanding in terms of the form, the type of family, right? What's the most typical family? Is it a two-parent family? Is it not, right? I mean, so descriptively or the form families take is one notion of normal or typical. But then we have this other notion of normal, which is more like functional or dysfunctional, right? A family can look a particular way, but the whether it's normal or not might depend upon does it actually do the things we think families should do. And, you know, single, for example, you know, single parent families most of them do raise kids successfully to adulthood. So their form is different, but, they're, but they function okay. And so I think understanding that difference between what families look like and what they do and how well they do it often gets confused. Conservatives frequently do that. I think others do too, but certainly conservatives do when we, you know, the, the decline of the family and, you know, what's a normal family and all these kinds of things. So it sounds like you'd be someone who'd say that, that because conservatives always say family is the bedrock institution of society and, and all these things, yeah, but it, it, someone might be listening to you and thinking that you're, you're yeah. disagreeing with that. Are, are families bedrock institutions of society? Yeah. They are, you know, and I think one way one way I, I've always thought about this book project and my research on the family is that what I want to do is construct a non-conservative defense of the family as a social institution. So, so if we tie this to the form and function thing, right? I mean, w what I would argue is is that the functions that families perform are irreplaceable. You need the family as a social institution, but that doesn't mean the family needs to be the identical form of the family throughout history. It hasn't been. And just because, you know, we see one form at one time doesn't mean it's it's universal. So, so I think for me, it's recognizing that multiple family forms are capable of, of, of performing the functions that we expect families to perform. I, I guess how strict is the definition of family here? So is anything that fulfills the functions that we've outlined for a family – a family? Yeah. Uh, for, well, it, it, you know, it's tricky, right? Because obviously you, if you start defining family in terms of blood relationships, right, you've got a couple problems right away because number one, the obvious one is we have adoption and things like that. But, but more importantly, right, the very foundational relationship that creates families is not a blood relationship. You don't marry people you're blood related to, right? So, so the family from this – what forms families in most cases, if we think marriage, right, is not a blood so, – so, but then once you say it's not about blood relations, right, where do you – what stops something – you know, how do we know what a, what a family is or is not? Where is that line? And I'm not sure there is a – a kind of bright line that we can say this is and this isn't. Um, you know, maybe maybe like pornography, we know it when we see it. But, but we certainly know that that families are institutions in which people care for each other, in which in which children are raised, uh, in which people engage in 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 you know the sort of household production activities, uh, in which people engage in sexual activities. Right? These are all part of what we think of as being as being a family. Um, and and certainly legal definitions, we we can. Def 
people who aren't legally married but who raise children together, I think we have no problem calling them families in, 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 a, in a sort of sociological or social scientific sense. So uh, maybe I'm dancing around your question, uh, but I think the best way to understand – I think the best way to understand what families are is generally by what, what does this – what is this group of people doing, right? And do, is what they're doing looking like the things we expect families to do? Because we, we know – I mean we know even marriage, right? I mean we talk about single parent families all the time and there we're thinking about kids. Are we are – we, what, about, what about a couple who never had kids – but who has their elderly parents living in with them, you know, is that what, what, you know, yeah, that's a family, right? So, I mean, how, how do we, you know, how do we, how do we categorize all these things is an interesting question. So let's get into the history of the family because as we sort of scoped out here, a lot of people who think that the family is, I mean, like you said, the bedrock institution of society, it's, it, they're often think that they're talking about the same thing. And sometimes it seems like, especially conservatives, Seem like they're talking about a nuclear family or a Leave It to Beaver type family that was, you know, around in ancient Jerusalem and was also around in in the fifties and should be around today because it's crucial. Uh, what's wrong with that view? Uh, you you give the history of the family in sort of a few chapters and you start with the fa the family under poverty. Yeah. So I think that the problem with it is, is that it just, well, it's not true, right? I mean, the, the family has, uh, the family has evolved and changed in a whole bunch of different ways. And certainly for most of human history, the primary challenge facing human beings and therefore facing families was, was grinding poverty, right? That, that, uh, who producing food and surviving and ensuring that your children survived was the overwhelming task for, for human beings, uh, and, and that was done within the, the family. The family as a social institution was the primary way we did that. One way to think about that is that the family historically for most of human history has been the unit of production, right? And the farming agriculture is the most obvious example. We think about married couples running a farm and again, perhaps having a lot of kids and other relatives pitching in to help help do this. And this, you know, this mattered for marriage, right? Who who, who would you, you know, who did you marry? Who you married for most of human history was was someone, you know, you could you could work effectively with. The the notion of marrying for love is a relatively recent phenomenon. We can come back to that in a little bit. But for most of human history, right, it was in economist terms, you wanted complementary human capital combinations, right? But that were about production. It wasn't, you know, look how beautiful it is, is look at those shoulders. She can plow, right? That's, you know, when, when we think about what that's, that's, po husband, that's poetry right there. Yeah, I'm telling you. Yeah. Eighth century romantic poetry. <laughs> well, right. And, and, and which note, no, by the way, right? All the romance that we think of back even, you know, say five, six hundred years ago, romance normally wasn't husband to wife. It was it was mistress, right? Or I mean, Abelard and Heloise or Romeo and yeah, Juliet. Yeah, right. You're, you're, who you married, again, unless you were the very rich, right? Who you married was was very much a narrow sort of economic and very calculated in some sense uh, decision. And and both, you know, wives and kids were were in some sense the analog, analogous to employees, Um and the household was a firm, and you were producing enough enough to survive. And the re result of that, again, was marriage for love was a luxury people couldn't afford. Um, we, the sort of limitations on women's right, you know, women's rights that we we think about all the time. Uh, family size was big, right? You wanted to have a lot of kids to help work the farm, and kids were an economic asset, including when you when you got old. Uh, you know, and if you, you know, it was certainly uh, much cheaper and more fun to make your own labor than it is to hire it. Uh, so, so what you know, large families were were part of this too, um, and childhood wasn't what we think of today either, right? I mean, kids were viewed as as you know were, were off to work early on, um, and education was fairly rare. Again, you had to have the wealth to do it. So, in in that sort of chapter on the family in poverty, and I really emphasize, and again, this is all pretty common knowledge among historians, right? There's nothing new here, but what hap what begins to happen over time is that we see that the transition take place. With the advent of capitalism and markets and industrialization in the late 18th and 19th century, um, so so there, right? I mean, the the key the two key developments there are people uh, are able to work outside the home in a in a major consistent way for really the first time in human history, right? I mean, we, oh, some of that, but now more people are able to work in factories or make their living trading. This is sort of a Deirdre McCloskey type story here too, right? Um, and so. Once work goes out of the household and people can earn a living outside the household, the sort of space that economics filled up in the household is now available to other kinds of things. At the same time, that 
same industrial revolution and capitalist revolution was making people wealthier. Uh, and and though early on, we know, you know, mom, dad, and the kids all had to to work in the factories. Not didn't take long for the kids to come home and mom to come home and dad to be able to support them all, you know, on on his own income. And it's at that point that we begin to see the transition to what we think of as the modern family, where now people can afford to marry for love. You don't have to worry so much about you know how strong her shoulders are. Um, you can, and, and, and this, of course, creates a much more equal relationship between men and women. It's not coincidental. We see late ni- middle, late 19th century, the f- first women's rights movement and the end of coverture, the end of you know, the limits on what married women could do with their property. Uh, all of these things begin to liberate women in these ways. And we begin to see marriage itself become more equal. Domestic violence for the first time takes on a negative tinge in a way it, it hadn't before. At the same time, family size begins to shrink. You don't need so many kids. Parents start to regulate their fertility a little bit, uh, you know, more more carefully, uh, and and then the kids get invested in more, and we begin to see by the end of the 19th century the sentimentalization of childhood and what's sometimes called the sheltered childhood, a kind of precursor of some of the trends we're se- to seeing today in the extreme. And by the time we get into the 20th century, among the middle class anyway, we have what more or less looks like the the modern family. We don't quite have that 50s family yet. We still have, you know, people still took borders in and elderly parents and family size hadn't come down all the way. And women, you know, women's roles were shifting too. So, but by the 20th century, it looks more or less like we, like what we have now. That was pretty good. You just gave pretty much an overview of most of the book and about, no, that was good. Good job. <laughs> yeah, you can tell I've done this. <laughs> so there's, there's a rather strikingly common fable that we hear. Um, it shows up Hollywood movies often are based around this narrative or I, the fairy tales that I read to my kids, it seems to come up a lot, which is basically the opposite of the story you just told. So the story you just told is that wealth and the growth of wealth enriched the family in meaningful ways, that a lot of the things that we consider to be the most important parts of family life were themselves a result of having access to more wealth and some more freedom. Um, but there's this really common story of the real family exists among the poor, you know, where the the rich guy has to learn how to appreciate family and can only do it by becoming poor or spending time among the poor. So this is um, Annie. Or yeah. There was that Nicolas Cage movie a while back. You mean the one where he trades places he with, trades, yeah, with the or, poor people? Yeah. Uh, but it shows up in fairy tales all the time too. Like the you know the the pro, the rich son wanders across the poor family and learns the meaning of relationships. Um, and so why is that if if the story of wealth is so clear and there's wealth that enhanced these important family connections, why do so many of us either believe this counter narrative or at least just feel kind of drawn to it? It's a really – you know, I've never thought about that question, Aaron, and it's a really interesting one. And off the top of my head, I think part of the answer is there, within wealthy societies, right, that fairy tale has more resonance in the sense that poorer families within relatively wealthy societies, you know, might – probably spend more time together because they have a few other things to do. They don't have money to spend on other things, right? And so if it's about that, those cultivating those relationships, and oftentimes, let's be honest, those cultivating of those relationships are, are a consequence of poverty, right? You know, that, that the reason you have to cultivate those family relationships and you have to be close and especially with extended family is you're in relative poverty. But, but still, that's perhaps within, within the midst of plenty. But if you go back, I mean, I, I spent, when I started doing the sort of research on this book, uh, I was started when I spent ten weeks at, at uh, on a like you know, visiting gig at Bowling Green State when they had the Social Philosophy Center there, and I spent like a week reading these histories of the family from the you know that were histories of the 16, 17, 1800s. It's 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 worse than any horror movie you can. I mean, it was horrific. It was the most depressing week of my life, right? <laughs> to sort of you know, when people would you know they couldn't care for their own kids because they had to care for the farm, so they would. You know, give out their children to wet nurses to care for their infants. The wet nurses are overburdened. They would swaddle them up and leave them in their own filth. Right? Sometimes they'd hang them on hooks. Okay, just because they had nowhere else, literally nowhere else to put them. Or the other story that was quite common is they'd leave them to stay warm by the fire. You can imagine what happens next, right? A couple of good sparks, and 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 you've got a big problem. I mean, this is we this we can't even imagine this world, at least in the West today, right? So when we hear this that that kind of fairy tale story of well, the nobility of the poor family, right? 
again, it's it's kind of possible the same way the same way we can imagine we, we sort of romanticize farm families within the larger society today, right? I have a line in an old column of mine about how we're rich enough to play at being poor, mm-hmm. right? And and that's it's the same kind like of churning thing, butter right? for for fun. Yeah, yes. right. Yeah, I mean it's slow food, right? Yeah. right? Right. All these sort of things, right? But but the reality of that poverty when you're not in a, in the midst of plenty is a whole different thing. And I just would want to say, you know, people should read, uh, you know, Edward Shorter's book or a couple of the other references in my in my book, and just spend a couple of hours with those families and see whether you think there's much to romanticize. Well, I think Aaron's question, quite, yeah, Aaron's question is interesting because uh, it also goes back to some of the things you were talking about a few minutes ago about the Hayekian point about the great society, which is anonymous and and wealthy. I mean, or tends to wealth because the trading possibilities are higher. And then the little institutions within the society that are communities and tribes and families and other things that are how we are we evolved in those systems. And this is a point that Hayek makes that you cannot take the morality and interaction of the tribe and extrapolate it to the entire society. Right. And it's, and- it's interesting because that's – a lot of you could say that the right wants the you know state to be our mommy and daddy, and the left wants it to be a village, and it, it can't be either of those. So they're both extrapolating from the family, and then we complain about the anonymity of modern times and how soulless it is, and all these kind of things like that. Whereas like the person to person interaction is what we can get from this capitalist system that made the family a richer and, and better place. Right, right, and one way to think about this is that the the very outsourcing, to use that word, the outsourcing of the economic functions of the family to the marketplace that that capitalism and industrialization brought opened up the scope for the family to be this site of emotion, emotional and psychological and, 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 and you know, uh, on, all, on a sort of affection and all these other kinds of things that we think is so important about the family today, right? I mean, that's that's the interesting part. We, we, we created loving families you know the, the the story on the left sometimes is well capitalism turned the family into this sort of calculating rational you know econ- no it's just the opposite right the family to use McCloskey's sort of virtues language right the the what capitalism and industrialization did was to kick prudence out of the family and open up the space for love right that that you know love love is there in ways it never was before yeah the question of marrying someone by prudence which of course is is going to involve a lot of different economic situations. Um, I wanted to get get more into so if we're still at the family at poverty. Um, we, there's another element of the family at poverty which is related to this sort of great society concept is the political aspect of the family, which is somewhat at a rich level, a kind of Game of Thrones kind of marriage system. Um, but it's also the sense of expanding your trading possibilities beyond in a world where you only have status and you don't have contract, uh, even in that poverty world, being able to trade with more people is a good thing and marrying in that way is a good thing too. Right. And and I think that you can look at the political thing and right, as you say, in two levels. Even for poor families, one of the great things about marriage is that it in creating families is that it brings this whole other group of people into your world with a shared interest in grandchildren, right? So now you have this whole other network of family who is a resource that you can draw on. So marriage, even among the poor, marriage expands kind of the political community and the trading community, sure. But even the, the political community, sort of defense and things and you know, things like that, uh, in a way that that is is desirable. And among the rich, right? I mean, you know, we have Shakespeare plays and all kinds of things that that, that remind us of the politics of marriage among the wealthy and powerful. And it was a way to form alliances. As you said, very very much Game of Thrones. I have. I don't know if you know guys noticed it, but my one of my favorite footnotes in the book is the the one about Mon, the sort of Monty Python and the Holy Grail one, right? Which is, the, if, if you recall, the the wedding scene, right? That, that uh, in that movie is in fact a great example of the sort of upper class marriage, right? The, I, I the don't marriage. recall it actually. Yeah, so so um, uh, you, you know, it's the the King of Swamp Castle is trying to marry off his his somewhat uh, doddering son. Uh, to, in order to to, to to Princess Luki, right? And the idea is that that the reason he wants to marry her is because because her, her her father, her, you know, his son's father-in-law to be, has these great tracts of land, right? They're going to marry, and it's clearly all about the economics. And at one point, the character, the king character, refers to not instead of the marriage, refers to the merger of our children. Right? <laughs> so, and then and then even later on, when 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 Sir Lancelot, I think it is, comes in and 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 
carves up all the wedding guests and there's blood and dead people everywhere, right? The father insists, you know, we can't, we can't stop the wedding, right? The wedding has to go on, right? What's a little, what's a little blood? Uh, and, and again, the idea that this was so important politically and that sort of the emotional aspect of it and the fact that the son didn't even want to marry this person, right, didn't matter. And so the, the sort of politics, and again, as you say, in a world where status or power is, is much more important than contract, uh, marriage has a political element and family have a huge political element to it too. But I, I should have mentioned earlier, you know, one of the ways we know about the economic function of, of, of families and marriage back then, of course, is last names, right? We have all these last names that describe the work people did, Baker, Brewer, right? Fletcher, Miller, Miller, Arabs, right? Yeah. Miller right? Cooper was a barrel maker, right? All these kind of things, all the Smiths, right? So we, you know, that's how we know that family and, and, and occupation was once uh, that's a farmer, right? So, well, all, you know, all these kind of things. So, if there, I, I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of a feminist, uh, Marxist professor, which I've known many of them, and so is Aaron, actually. And Aaron once had a professor who said that serfdom was better than capitalism. Was that what she said? Yes, because the the lines of responsibility were clearer, and people knew who you were supposed to be taking care of, and they had obligations to take right. care of people based on status. So when you died at 35, at least you knew who was responsible. <laughs> yes. But, but I'm, I'm, we get to the 19th century. I could see a feminist maybe, oh, this is interesting. I've never really heard about this. It may be you know, capitalism or at least a very bare bones type of it. Uh, in the 18th century capitalism, the emergence of some amount of markets and trading helped women get out of just you know picking – things in the field and then never leaving them, just being sort of subjugated to their, their husband constantly. But it seems that the, in the 19th century, you could argue that the industrialization of the world pulled men out of the home and put them into a place where they were in positions of power because the marketplace was assumed to be a place of status and power and left women in the home and not, not given the opportunity to be in the marketplace, which, which exacerbated or, or maybe – uh, returned the subjugation of women at a new level, uh, starting in the sort of Victorian era and early 19th century. Yeah, and 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 there's truth to that, right? I mean, one thing I'll note is that the story that I'm telling, and certainly that I've told so far, is not inconsistent with a Marxian story, right? I mean, you know, if you read Marx's stuff on the family, it's a similar kind of story. I think we diverge more in the 20th century, but this this is an this is an interesting question, right? Because I mean. What it's true that that now men had power in the marketplace more often perhaps than they than they did before, and did that tr so before capitalism, men had power in the home, right? I mean, it was still right even in the world of poverty and sort of imagine agricultural family. Got the, the husband still has all the power. Now what's happened is he's earning that income outside the home and bringing it back to the home. Uh, and, and coming in, sort of, you know, coming in with that power, but but at the same time, the shift towards marriage for love created a weird kind of pressure, right? To the degree that now men and women were married because they loved each other, it became harder to justify tyranny within the home. Again, it happened. I'm not denying that it happened, but it's kind of it was on rockier ground, right? And there was a sense in which there was being. The fact that they loved each other opened up a door to a claim of equality that did not exist before, right? We're, and, yeah, go ahead. And there's also the – and these are sort of I think mutually feedbacking effects but you, you talk about the separate spheres. But the other thing you kind of get out of this is – because love is a product of wealth in this interpretation. But there are other things that come from wealth like – oh, say separate bedrooms for children and, and parents. Um, and so then you start getting almost a private sphere also coming out of the 19th century, which, which, which again, some feminists would say would be a bad thing, but maybe could actually be looked at as a good thing. And, and right. And, it, and it, again, all of those things that made marriage into this you know, more sacred, more emotion-based institution – at least created pressure toward equality. And the separate spheres point is important because the way this sort of played out was women basically began to say, OK, you guys have the public space of the market. We'll take the private space of the home. And all that Victorian domesticity that we think of, right, in, in, in often in nostalgic ways, was women laying a claim to the private sphere 
as their sphere. And, and this also extended into sort of civil society to some extent with charitable work among wealthier women and so on. But the argument, I mean, and, and, and there grew up this whole sort of rhetorical, ideological justification that argued, well, you know, it's, it's not unequal. Men and women just have different things they're good at and, and their own, their, 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 they're separate but equal, to use a phrase that would get mattered in other in other dimensions. But essentially, that was the argument, right? Different but equal might be a better way to put it, right? That, that it, and it was an argument about men, and you know, sort of same. Sometimes we see it in different forms today, but the distinct feminine and masculine qualities, and that women were responsible for the home and men for the public space, uh, and that that then that was a fair, in some sense, a fair deal, right? Um, but don't we but, have historical evidence of that sort of divide going? Way, way back. I mean, that's how like the ancient Greeks operated along those lines. With the women were right. basically in charge of managing the home, while the husband, although the husbands did the shopping. Um, but I mean, it it's seems to, to predate. Some, yeah, to some degree, but it was never, at least as I understand the history, that was never a way of, of never a, a an ideological cover that 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 made it seem equal. Right. Historically, okay. you, I mean, the sexual division of labor is universal. Right. It's not always the same people doing the same things. But the idea that men and women have generally different tasks is pretty universal. Right. But this the separate spheres in the Victorian era was was papered. That was papered over by this language of equality. Right. That said we have separate spheres, but they're both important. Right. And, and was that really true? No. But it became a way, sort of a f kind of first step on the road to equality. And you can see, right, how 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 the end of coverture and the beginnings of the women's suffrage movement and all these things were going to bust out from there, right? We're just going to say, well, wait a second. If 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 we're talking about, we really aren't equal. Well, this is just nonsense to sort of claim that the separate spheres are equal. We don't have the vote. We don't have full property rights, right? You know, we're not allowed. We're not educated in the same way that men are. I just, it's funny, I just finished reading Mary Wollstonecraft's uh, Vindication of the Rights of Women, which was written in the late 1800s and it's late, uh, late 18th century. And it's making, you know, it's, she's, was, she saw all this kind of coming and, and, and saw it at the time too, this sort of, you know, treating women as different. Uh, and, but later it became the difference turned into a just an argument for equality. And I think that's the difference you see at the turn of the 20th century. And there's a lot of interesting things you point out that I, I, I found to be very um – perceptive and kind of filling in gaps. So you talk about in the 19th century as we start to get uh, wealth that allows for uh, private spheres, for bedrooms, for homes, for children's rooms. Like we start associating – they're like children's toys that we, we have – we think of children's toys in the Victorian era. And we also think – start thinking about holiday celebrations as things that you do in your house with your family. So you think about traditional Christmas imagery of the Victorian era starts coming out there as opposed to a thing what we all go to the square and do together. Uh, we start doing it in our home. Um, these are all kind of interesting developments and that's part of the kind of, I guess you could say, invention of childhood in the 19th yeah. century. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Uh, what you begin to see is childhood as a distinct phase of life and then adolescence as a distinct phase of life, right? Because, you know, before that, kids would go out to work or apprenticeship at 10 or 11 or, or 12, uh, and, and boys at least anyway. And, and so that became, you know, that was the end of childhood as we think of it today. But once you have the, the wealth, once you have the, the sort of keeping kids in, in school and educating them, and then you have the development, the sort of privacy of the home and the call it the nuclearization of the family, right? The sort of pairing the family down to parents and kids, uh, and, and that sort of love and affection and all these kind of things have room to be there now. Yeah, you get you get this very different picture of childhood, and you get the kind of gauzy Victorian romantic version of the family, which was not untrue, right? In 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 some important ways. Um, Is this you know, like a specialization regime? I mean, basically. If it may be the case that in, say, 1450 – I think one of the answer to Aaron's question about the Greeks is that – I mean maybe not 1450, but at like 850, say, in England, I mean I think the Greeks had a high – considerably higher standard of living than your average person in 850 in sure. England. And, that, and that's also not exactly con con continuous socially with England. But I mean in, in, in 850, uh, if we're thinking about the nature of it takes a village – uh, it did, <laughs> it, it did and, yeah. and they could do that because – and they were poor and they're all very interrelated. It, it, it could take a village. They could have community laws that were strong enough to treat 
the community like a family. Yeah. Um, it took a village, but it's also inexorably related to the fact that they were really poor. Yeah, and and, and any, any decision, any decision that a family made, let me be generalized. Any decision that a family makes in a really poor society is likely to have spillover effects to the rest of the community. So who you married mattered. If you didn't marry someone who could help you produce, it wasn't just you who were potentially you know, at risk. It was your ability to provide for the community because your margin might have mattered a lot. And, and, and so pr the privatizing of the family, the turn towards home, right, is, it is certainly related to wealth. It just seems like interesting because you're al we're almost inventing privacy. Yeah. And, and one of the interesting – Yes, we, certainly the idea the man's home is his castle, right, which has a nefarious version. But if we just think in terms of uh, the idea of, of, of the privacy of the home, right, that is certainly made possible by the economic changes of the 18th and 19th centuries. And more, and, oh, sorry, Aaron. I just, I'm, it just occurred to me this may be a completely wrong way of thinking about it. But does this invention of childhood and invention of adolescence – is it possible to look at that as like a declining comparative advantage of children that like as you get wealthier, children just don't have any comparative advantages anymore <laughs> and so we yeah. just let them have an adolescence where they don't really try to contribute well, because right. I, it's, it's easier for me to do those chores than to fight with my kids about it. <laughs> well, now you're, now you're talking about your family. Yeah, yeah, well, the no, question is, it, it, you know, your kids can mow the lawn because you, you, you should be working here. You know? right, no, right. I, I think, the way I'd put it is, is that kids, right, we, we are wealthy enough. I often say this to my students when I do talks at the schools. We're wealthy enough that you guys, meaning college students, right, can sit around for your first 22 years of your life and not produce anything. Right. I mean, we're we, we are wealthy enough that we can invest in you in those ways. And so I, I think that investment in, in their human capital is what prolongs childhood and adolescence and, 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 and in these ways. So we, we were able to invent this distinct thing because we did. It's not so much that kids didn't have things they could do. We didn't need them to do it. Right. Yeah. And, that, and that's and that's a point I've made a lot. And you cite our colleague Brink Lindsay's Age of Abund Abundance book, which is a spectacular book. It is. But you, you don't have. I mean, adolescence and how much adolescence consumerism, for example, defines modern culture. You don't have rock and roll without adolescence. I mean, we first invented childhood, and let's say that's until ten, and then we invented teenagerhood. Let's just you know say eleven or thirteen to eighteen, and then we gave them disposable income and maybe a garage for a garage band and a, a cheap, relatively cheap guitar, um, and now they can produce culturally relevant artifacts. And then we can all sit around and be nostalgic about how everything was awesome when we were eighteen, and they don't make as good of music anymore. Right. And now. Now we've just like pushed it forward to our third our, our thirties. I mean, I think Aaron always wants to ban millennials. I mean, it's his favorite hashtag, I do. Yes. and I think that's it's the same story too. And the psychologists talk about now late adolescence or post adolescence to describe that that period of life. So here's the really tricky part today. I think right, we've extended the the you know the the thing people say about millennials is they don't reach the mark the traditional markers of adulthood right until they're whatever and we've extended 40, childhood <laughs> right right we've extended childhood and adolescence socially but biologically the age of first menses has never been less right girls are starting their periods at 11 and 12 right so now, right, we have this long period of time where girls are capable of re – are biologically capable of reproducing but sort of are emotionally and developmentally and financially not necessarily prepared to be mothers. And if you think about – I don't know if you – Aaron, I can't remember if you have little girls or not but – I have both. He has two and a, and a little two boy. Two girls and a boy. He heads up, right? So yeah, this is, yeah, no. I'm... This, is, this is the thing, right? And so, so – the, if you think back a couple hundred years, we, we threw kids into adulthood before they were biologically adults. And now we've done the reverse, right? They're biologically adults long before we throw them into adulthood. At I least, want, again, all Western developed kind of world. As a way of getting uh, – uh, uh, connecting this to um, other relevant topics because I said this gets very, very big and it has many uh, fingers and many elements of social thought. But uh, – after we get to privacy and we get modern family and we, we start really ending the subjugation of women um, or start really on the path of that with women's right to vote and increasing their ability to earn outside of the outside of the home and increase their human capital, 
Uh, this leads to even things you argue like the normalization and then legalization of same-sex marriage to some extent. Yeah, and and I think you know we what we've seen happen is that the to to the degree that marriage becomes I'll put it this way to the degree that we be, among heterosexuals began to separate marriage, sex, and uh, and, and 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 child and, and you know pregnancy right uh, of raising children that those all became separate things at one time right those were all thought to happen together now you can be married. And have sex but not have kids. You can have sex and not be married, right? I mean, no, there's all the combinations there. And once we busted that up and once marriage became about – clearly about love for almost all of the sort of population of the wealthier countries, it's it's inevitable that the same-sex marriage thing would, would, would come before us, right? One reason is is that the development of, of sort of gay and lesbian identity in and of itself was a product of these same sort of social forces. Capitalism made it – created the wealth and the work opportunities in the cities for gay for gay men and lesbian women to survive outside the typical heterosexual family. And so we saw the rise of, you know, New York and San Francisco and so on as, as, as sort of uh, homes to gay population. You could be anonymous. You didn't need to have family. And over time, right, that sort of that turned into the ability to live one's life and to identify as gay or lesbian as a, in the way that we think about race and ethnicity and so on. And so once you kind of have that and once you have marriages about love and it's not about kids, you can see why same-sex couples were saying, well, wait a second. <laughs> why are we any different? We're just like you. We love each other. Our, our relationship is about affection It's a, and it's about romance. It's about uh, sex. Um, it, it doesn't have to be about kids. Look at all these childless heterosexual couples, right? So why are we any different? And, and you know, Stephanie Kuntz, the historian of the family who, who I draw on quite a bit in some of this stuff, you know, her, her line is, I think, the best one, which is the, the, the real revolution was not same-sex marriage. The real revolution was marriage for love. And once you had marriage for love, you know, the, the toothpaste was out of the tube and it wasn't going back. Uh, and, and so here we are today. And, uh, and one of the ironies of writing the book was – I got the page proofs to correct on the book the day the Obersfeld decision was rendered. Nice. And that was and that was some beautiful cosmic harmony right there. Now, it meant I had to fix some things, right? Because <laughs> Because I and, and you know because I had said some things about the case that were all sort of in the future tense and I and I quickly was able to fix a couple paragraphs in that one chapter to to, to get it back but but yeah I mean and and plus the idea of of of, of a same sex family right the notion that 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 gays and lesbians have families and could have families and not just sort of children but in Kath Weston's words families we choose right. Now things th things have changed a lot. I mean they will and they, and you write about how much things are going to change in the future but. With – in the latter part of the 20th century and into the 21st century, we have a bunch of factors. Uh, divorce is an issue uh, which is related to the economic possibilities of women, the – what you call market-oriented human capital versus household-oriented human capital. Uh, now we have a big conversation about dual-income families. What, what kind of important conversations should we be having now about the nature of family? What should we be realizing about what's happening to the family now? Well, a couple of things I think that we're going to have to deal with, you know, as as we move on. Um, off the top of my head, a few. One one good thing I think is there are good things that are happening. One good thing is more and more people are able to work out of their homes, right? Uh, and that that changes a lot of this to the degree that say men can t telecommute as we used to call it, working on your own now, right? Suddenly, childcare looks different, and the division of labor between men and women, and who does what, and and if both parents can work out of the home, sometimes, right? Suddenly, a lot of these issues, and especially issues about the sort of gender division of labor within the household, begin to look really different, right? And we're weirdly kind of back to the world we were with people working in the home, but they're working in the home, but being paid, you know, for work for what amounts to work in the market, and so it's not as if the home. It's not that the home is the firm. It's just the physical site where you're working for someone else, right? And so it's so it's a weird mixture of the past. And I think that's as the more of that that we see, that's going to change how millennials and others, you know, think about marriage and family and who has what responsibility. And and I think if the more it happens, I think that will continue to narrow the gender wage gap because it takes the it it it, it enables it makes more easy an equal division of labor within the household, and it gives both 
genders more flexibility in ways that I think are, are, are valuable. So that's one thing. I think the other thing that we're going to have to deal with is, is what, does it, what does extended life expectancy mean for marriage? And I'll, here's the blunt version of the question. Are we biologically capable of being married to the same person for 75 or 100 years? That seems. That, I mean, my parents are pushing fifty, but that, I mean, that, to add another twenty-five years. That's going to be right. right. Crazy. That's, a long, yeah. that's a long time. That's a long time for any, no matter how much you love someone. That's a long time, and and I meant I mean the biological part. I mean, our pair bonding is has a biological basis, right? And I don't know if it can sustain that. So I, you know, here's a, I don't like making prediction, but here's a prediction that I think we will see happen: is I think we'll see more people as life expend, ex, except uh, life expectancies extend engaging in kind of serial marriages, right? You can imagine someone saying, I want to be married to one person when I'm young, perhaps when we can travel and do stuff. Maybe I want to have, but maybe that's not the person I want to have kids with. And then I have kids and maybe when I'm older, I want to be with someone else. And one other thing to consider too is that marriage, I think, has now become, at least relatively, again, it's still important if you have kids, but relatively more important at the end of life. Right. You want someone there to care for you at the end. Young people don't need it. Right. That's why marriage rates are down and right? they just don't need it. Right. But they're going to want it when they're older. It wouldn't surprise me to see a lot of people who are single for a long time and then suddenly getting married. Right. Later in life because they, they think I need someone to take care of me and I, and I need companionship when I'm not working anymore. So so I think there's some be some interesting things that could happen there with respect. Well, um, it seems that we're going to have. Uh, I mean, the, the economic status of women continues to increase, and it continues to increase relative to men in Western countries. For example, going to college and all these things, and and they can also have kids outside of wedlock and all, and this all this stuff. It seems that increasingly, I mean, it's it's you know, my grandma she literally used to say, "Why buy the cow if you can get the milk for free?" To like to like my you know female cousins, and now casual sex is okay, so the milk for free. And they, I mean, all these things are socially acceptable. So, what reason is there to get married? I mean, are we are, are almost are we almost eliminating the reasons that marriage have existed historically? And so now we might have to talk about, as we said, the form and the function of the family. Could we could the family kind of disappear? I, I don't think so. I think so. So there's a couple things here, right? We the the, so, the social scientific, and I will give my conservative friends this, you know, who are listening in particular. They're they're absolutely right about one empirical fact. The social scientific evidence is clear that all other things equal, kids do better in two parent families than in single parent family. Now they do, you know, if it's single parent by widowhood or de death of a parent, they look more like two parent families. It's divorce, right? That clearly does make on average, right, kids worse off. And so we can talk about that and questions about that, but it's, it's, it's true. And I think it's, it is better for kids, again, all other things equal, to be raised in a sort of loving two-parent, and I would note no matter what the genders are, uh, two-parent family. Uh, two works better than one. So in that sense, that's, if you're thinking about having kids, having marriage or some kind of marriage-like institution makes a lot of sense. And, and, and I think we do run into trouble the ways in which the welfare system subsidizes single parenthood and or penalizes marriage depending on your income level and especially the way it does so among poor folks. Uh, the, the, the tax and welfare system is set up to penalize marriage among poor people and that's a real problem. So in that sense, you know, the, the disappearance of marriage, which I'm not so sure it's really disappearing. I think it's just changing. But to the degree it's being driven – by policy, and I don't talk a lot about this in the book because other people have have done the work on this fairly well. I mean, I mention it, but but I do think we could make some some policy changes that would help this a lot. So in that sense, I don't think it's going away. And weirdly, the other way in which marriage is is not and family isn't going away is obviously same sex couples. And the other thing I was going to mention earlier is what are we going to do with uh, you know uh, uh, polyamory, right? And when what is the demand for for more than two going to come at us. And I think it will. And that raises some other interesting questions too. So it, it seems like people want to live with other people, right? Uh, what's true is economically it's not as necessary, particularly for women. If you thought, if you think about marriage as being kind of specialization and exchange the way it has been for much of human history, that's gone. The narrow benefits to marriage in, in wealthier economies for men and women are gone. Why marry? Now it becomes companionship, right? You know, it's you're not marrying for the big broad shoulders, but you're marrying because you both like to ski, 
or you like to see this, you know, see the same movies or read the same books, right? That's that's kind of the foundation of of a lot of merit or eat the same food, right? That's that's sort of where it is, right? And and I think that's probably a good thing, but it does mean that people are pickier and we see people marrying later. Um, and I think technology is going to let us have kids later too, if we want. Another concern is is are we you know reproducing ourselves, right? We've seen this happen in Western Europe and and in Asia. You know, uh, so many one-child families or people who don't have kids and the dem- demographics of that and who is having kids and who isn't and what that means uh, is a whole interesting set of questions too. So one of the concerns that you hear um, that I'm curious how these trends play into and what we do about it if it seems to be – like we don't, we don't want to limit the growth of wealth, right? But um, – and we don't, we don't want to stop markets from functioning and we don't want to stop a lot of these positive trend lines but there are – scenarios, some of which you just outlined, where things could turn bad because of it. Um, and one that seems to be relatively common today is this – the rising status of women added to the fact that women tend not to want to marry down. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That they – that men will marry down in social class or whatever else, whereas women won't. And so as more and more women gain – Wealth and more and more women go to college, and we're now we're now at majority women for sixty like percent for actually. colleges. Yeah, in most colleges. Um, you end up with large portions of men who can't find a mate because they're lower status than the women, and then large portions of women who can't find a mate because so many of the available men are lower status, and that you know I mean there's all sorts of problems associated with unattached men. Yep. Um, violence and poverty and bad stuff. And so how do we how do we address these kinds of problems without you know killing the golden goose without saying well let's limit the wealth or in other ways bring in government in pernicious functions. Yeah, and it's not even clear what government could do about this. I'm short of limiting the wealth, which I'm not which would not even sure it would work anyway, but you know what? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to imagine what it would be. Sort of, you know, f- uh, forced, forced, uh, uh, you know, get all those men into a program where we teach them, you know, manners and <laughs> <laughs> the pickup artist stuff, yeah. or, or right, or, or desensitize them to, to to video games or something like that, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, now we're into saying Clockwork Orange, yeah. or something, right? <laughs> right? So, but yeah, I'm I'm not sure what we do about that. To be honest with you, I think you know, part of me wants to say. Women who, you know, why isn't it the case th- that women who gain in wealth won't be as willing as men who have wealth to quote unquote marry down, right? You know, what, why, what, what's driving women to see this differently? Is it, I mean, it could be an, you know, sort of evolutionary concern about I need to make sure that the, uh, that the person I marry is a provider for my children. But in a world where, you know, the, the ability to work, after having a kid for women is, is, is so much easier than it used to be. Is that all that important? And, and what, you know, if you're a high status, high income woman, what do you really want out of your husband? You know, the, if you want to have kids, what do you want out of your husband? Presumably someone, you know, kind of reliable and whatever, but it's not necessarily the case you need resources. You might need their time, right? If they're willing to be a stay at home dad, I mean, why, why doesn't it just flip in ways? Right. I, I don't know. I'm not sure what the answers are to that. I just, I, it's, I think, though you're right, the one thing we don't want to do is is kill you know is is kill the goose that's laying the golden egg, and I'm not sure what else we can do about it. Um, certainly, you know, one of the things I would like to see happen is I wonder how many you know sort of lower income men were oversold on college and then never found themselves in a you know in, in sort of found themselves trapped between not getting the job they wanted and not having skills to do kind of you know high paying manual labor if we had more particularly young men perhaps but young even young women too who realized right away they didn't need college to make a good living right and be a good person uh, and uh, you know I wonder whether that wouldn't help this too again I'm 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 speculating there but if we're talking about what the way the concerns we have what how the family I mean, this should be. There's a normative question we're dealing with here, which is interesting within the framework you've discussed. Because if we look at the family as an evolving institution, then there's a completely positive way of looking at it, where we just we look at the environment it evolves within, and we analyze different constraints upon it, and say, 
here's why women were this way in poor times and then the 19th century and this is why the family, all this stuff that we've discussed. But what, how do we be normative about this when we're like looking at into the future and saying this is how families should be or this is the way we should be concerned if they're being dysfunctional or if they're being undercut? Aren't they always just going to be reacting to the environment that they're within, the policies they're within? I, yeah, to some degree, but I, I think you know. I think we can ask. This is kind of the question I ask in the in the chapter on on the parenting stuff, right? Which is, what what's the and, and this is the Hayekian question too. What's the family's role as a social institution in contributing to the survival and thriving of a liberal society, right? And, and so you know, we I do we need families. We need to make sure that kids are raised well, for example, right? Um, so there's a normative kind of issue we might take up. Um, and, and, if we, and if we believe that kids are raised best in an environment of two parents who are happily married to each other, okay, then, then how, do we, you know, how do we get out of the way of that happening? How do we help ensure that it, it does happen? Right? That becomes a way to ask some of those normative questions. You know what we're seeing with parenting right now, right? Are, are too many kids, and I'm not sure it's as widespread as the worst people, you know, the sort of worst version is. But too many kids kind of coming to, to coming to adult responsibilities without adult skills to deal with them. Okay, uh, and you ask anyone who teaches or is staff at colleges today about the sort of increased number of kids who simply can't navigate the world or can't navigate it without their parents. That's a scary, you know, that's a scary thing for a free society or a society that aspires to be free, right? Um, and to the, the degree to which childhood is either extremely risk averse, right? We don't let kids take any chances. We pad them up and we give them playgrounds with 10 feet of cushion on it, right? And sort of the Lenore Skenazy type stuff. Or that we, or the reverse, where kids take all kinds of crazy chances and their parents bail them out all the time, right? Those seem both of those seem really bad <laughs> for a world in which we want entrepreneurship and reasonable risk taking and people to bear responsibility for their actions, right? So, so we can I think we can talk about families normatively too, and 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 even you know explanation isn't justification. So even if we can explain. Why families, I, I mean, I have an explanation in that chapter, I think, about why we've come to this sort of hyper parenting stuff. Um, but that doesn't mean it's right. <laughs> and it doesn't, you know, it's not a nirvana fallacy sort of thing, right? Where, 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 you know, we, where everything that is, 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 is ideal. So I still, I think we can push back. And again, policy is part of that, right? But also our, you know, our beliefs about parenting matter here too, for, for what we, you know, how families play in a liberal society. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, please take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Free Thoughts is produced by Mark McDaniel and Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.